scheduled to our podcast. And thanks for being here today with us. So let's talk a little bit about lithium because lithium is definitely probably, I would say, one of the hottest sort of topics in our field right now, especially within the marine industry related to battery systems. And you brought up a good point about these concept of these drop-in replacements. It, it comes out, of course, um, people want it to be easy, right? They want the benefits of, you know, and I tell people and correct and chime in here. But for so me, I it's, see, Jeff, you know, you know um, uh, I think Melissa's just put up a shot of a uh, lithionics, mm -hmm. uh, lithium ion battery. Uh, with an external BMS. And this is one of those batteries that has a, a very uh, broad ability to communicate outside the battery, um, and which is that little middle cable that you've got there as a communications cable. Um, so, uh, but this means this battery, it, it's not really a battery, it's an energy storage system. Because now we've got the capability to integrate this battery uh, with all the charging devices on the boat, for example, so that if the battery sees a condition in which it's, it's likely to get overcharged, it can send out a message to shut down the charging devices. Mm. Uh, if it sees a condition in which it, it's getting close to shutting down because of a lack of charge, it can send out a warning message and maybe uh, turn on one of those charging devices. Uh, so it's got that external communication capability. The other thing that, that I want in my boat with lithium ion, which I don't have at the moment. I do have lithium ion batteries. I'm, I won't discuss which brand they are. Um, but the other thing I want with my lithium ion batteries is a sticker on the battery that says it's tested to UL 1973. Uh, that's the most aggressive abuse testing standard in the marketplace, uh, in the marine marketplace at least. And it means uh, that whatever I do stupid, and I do do stupid things like everybody else, plus I, I push these these systems to their published limits just to see what happens. I mean, it's part of what I do for a living. Uh, but with lithium ion, if you get it wrong, it's likely to go up in smoke and you lose the boat. So with that UL 1973 sticker on the battery, you can be pretty certain that there's just about nothing stupid you can do that's going to cause that battery to catch fire and you're going to lose the boat. So that's you would lose the boat. Yeah, yeah. There's no that's doubt. what I want on my uh, lithium ion battery is that sticker on the side of the battery says it's UL 17, 1973 tested. The, and there's, there's not many batteries have it because the testing is very expensive. Yeah, I, I actually I went to UL to see how they do that. Oh yeah? Um, oh yeah, they do crazy stuff. Like uh, they put a battery in a, with a metal screen around it and they put it in an oven and they heat it up until it explodes. Well, you know, which you can get pretty much any lithium mine battery to explode. Um, yeah. It has to have a battery case that's strong enough to make sure there's no projectiles that'll come through the screen outside, the, you know, stuff like this. Um, they take one cell in the battery and they totally discharge it and then they fully charge all the other cells. So the battery is totally unbalanced. Uh, and then uh, they put it on a full out charge rate to see if they can drive that one cell into thermal runaway, um, which will, in a lithium ion battery, well, again, it'll start a fire in the cell. Uh, so they do a lot of really, really, they take the BMS and uh, they, introduce a, a fault to it uh, and it has to have a redundant capability so it can handle a single fault within the battery management system mm. uh, so uh, uh, and of course this all drives the cost of the batteries up uh, and it makes them expensive but on the other hand uh, what's peace of mind worth yeah that's a challenge you know i see yeah. it all the day and you know it's funny people are buying you know some people you know we're, very few people are putting lithium in a ten thousand dollar value boat you know you're seeing i see but boaters that are buying, you know, catamarans for, you know, half a million, you know, 300, 400, 750, a million dollars, which sounds like an obscene amount of number, but I mean, that's, some boats are costing that. And that's yeah. not on the top end. That's, you know, that's a 40 foot, 45 foot, 50 right. foot catamaran. Right. And, and yet they've, they've spent X on the boat and then they're looking and I've had some owners and, and it's, it's almost like a misalignment in values. And they're like, yeah. I need to save as much money as humanly possible on a battery bank. Right. That will be either underneath my bed or <laughs> literally behind my head. Yes. And I yeah. tell them, I'm like, why would you, yeah. why would right. you be a smoker and have a flammable couch? Right. Like, you know, I know it's less money to put right. flammable material in a couch, but why would you want that? And I think that's the problem is yeah. people can't connect the dots. They, 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 they're very, um, they just don't want to go there because the price well, that's is our much. job. You have to help them connect the dots. Yeah. Yes. And of course, if we do it right, they'll listen to us.
Yep. Yeah, and that's what this, I, you know, it goes back to, uh, it, it's a little bit the spirit of this conversation, right? Is to try to, people have a hard time being told what to do in general. Now, all of us, certainly myself, but if you tell me why I should do something, tell me the reasons, and you give me an explanation, and I'll come to the, that conclusion, then yeah, I'm all in. You know, and I think that's what it comes down to. It's not just telling them voters what they should or shouldn't do, but educating them as the reasons why we should do something mm -hmm. or the reasons we shouldn't. And then let most people will come to the same conclusions. Not everyone, because it all we all different have values. So what are your reasons for doing lithium? Like what would you if you're talking oh, for it's yourself? The performance. You know, it's the uh the energy density. There's there's on a volume or weight basis, there's probably uh people say four times as much or energy density or, or a quarter of the volume. But actually, by the time you put the BMS in and stuff like that, you're probably talking two to one. But mm. then, you know, if we've got lead acid batteries, we normally speaking, we're using less than 50% of the capacity at each cycle. Yep. With lithium, we're probably using 70 if we really push it 80%. Um, so then you need less of them. So by the time you're done, you probably are talking uh, a quarter of the batteries for a similar performance. So, yeah. and then uh, if you have a, maybe half as many batteries or, or even a similar amount, you've got way more performance. And in our case, you know, we developed that uh, integral system uh, uh, alternator that puts out eight kilowatts. Yeah, I saw that. So yeah. I need a, a battery bank that will absorb eight kilowatts of charging power. And on our boat, because we don't have air conditioning, uh, but we don't have, you know, fridge and freezer and uh, microwave and all kinds of bits and pieces. Uh, but in uh, on half an hour, of engine runtime, when we're pulling up the anchor to get out of an anchorage or we're leaving the dock, in, in the time it takes us to do that, we can put enough energy in that battery bank with that integral alternator to run the boat for 24 hours. Yeah, that's the dream. Yeah, yeah. And you know, we've spent 40 years stressing over the state of charge of our batteries, like everybody else, you know, constantly checking the state of the charge, thinking maybe I better do a bit of battery charging at anchor. Uh, these last few years, because I've been wanting to push the system hard for test purposes, I've been doing stupid things like boiling water in an electric kettle at the same time as I'm boiling it in the microwave and then dumping hot water down the sink so that the hot water heater is running so that I can load the system up just to, just to see what it'll do. <laughs> at one point, we had eight kilowatts of electric heaters on the boat when we were testing, this was in Ireland, the weather was miserable. But there were times when we still had open every hatch and porthole on the boat to let the heat out because we had eight kilowatts of electric heaters running just so I could load the system up to see what it would do. So what size inverters do you have on board right now? We had eight kilowatt inverter. Yeah. How much? Eight kilowatts. So we had everything maxed out. I wanted to see what would break first. You know, By so the way, you know what? How big is your boat? Is it 45? It's 40. Well, it's, they call it a Marlow 46, but it's actually 48 feet. It's a, it's a and, no, you're the only one that has an eight kilowatt inverter on board, unless you have air conditioning. There's just, there's no... <laughs> like, like, yeah, I mean, there's no way we can use all the energy we can generate at the moment. Um, yeah. But uh, it's, uh, well, that's, that's basically one of the things I do is to try to test things to destruction to see what's going to break first. Uh, and and then uh, I'll get a hold of the manufacturer or whatever and say, you know, this is what happened. And then maybe they'll, They'll uh, fix it. Do they listen? It. We know, yeah, sometimes. Uh, and if not, we at least we know where the boundaries are. Yeah. And then uh, we can go ahead and make sure that we design systems that are pretty bulletproof. There was so, one point with that testing where I'm where I discovered a means to create a, something called a harmonic vibration, and I could break a belt in four minutes. You know, these are these are timing belts, ribbed timing belts off a car that we were using because they're very rugged, and I could make this belt go totally crazy and break a belt in four minutes so so then uh, the uh, the manufacturer had to spend a ton of money figuring figuring out how this was happening uh, nobody else could do it it was it was unique to our boat and certain speeds and and uh, resonant features and and they figured it out and got to a point where i couldn't do it anymore uh oh. so, yeah <laughs> that's that that's a i mean Breaking things to learn things is a good way. I mean, we, we don't intentionally break things. Uh, our client base do that for us. Right. You know, yeah. the thousands of voters that we right. help out. And yeah. we learn from we learn from our own mistakes, other people's yeah. mistakes. Yeah. You know, as long as you're learning from the mistakes, then tomorrow is a better day. Yep. Yeah. yeah.
So what's your charge rate going into your lithium bank? Uh, well, we've cool. got, it's a 48 volt bank because otherwise the, um, the cables would be huge. Yeah. So uh, we're putting in, what well, we start out at eight kilowatts. So if we do the math, that's 8,000 divided by 50 is uh, 160 amps, I think. So it's a lot lower than we might be doing with a you know high output alternator at 12 or 24 volts. Yeah. Um, but in terms of energy, you know, it's massive. twice as much as we can get from pretty much any other, even the best of the high output alternators on the market. Yeah, the, uh, that's right. You know, the, the APS alternators that Ocean Planet Energy sells, Yeah, those have terrific performance characteristics at 12 and 24 volts. So what's the output at low RPM on those alternators? What, what, um, what, do you, what makes it terrific? Like, what does it make so awesome? Well, there's two things. One is the, uh, the maximum output. Actually, there's three things. The maximum output, which is typically speaking, uh, these alternators are ready when they're cold. Yeah. Well, when you run them hard, within five minutes, they're uh, up to, the, the case is probably up to well over 100 degrees centigrade. Um, so then they, they, uh, the output goes down. So then efficiency becomes really important. And those APS alternators are some of the more efficient ones on the market. You know, the, the typical automotive alternator is maybe 50% efficient much of the time. Uh, these APS alternators are around 70%. Some of the Balmars are as well. Um, and then um, the other thing that's critical to all of us is that they ramp up their output at low RPMs. Yeah. Uh, especially if we're battery charging at anchor. Uh, because if you've got to run the engine, you know, two and 3,000 RPM to get the alternator to, to wide open to a full output, you're not going to do it. No. So what you thought was a 200 amp alternator is really a 100 amp alternator. Yeah. Um, so that, that is, is a really critical feature, is getting it to ramp up the output at low RPMs. And we spent a ton of money with the integral system working on that. And we got it to the point where with the engine at 1,000 RPM, we're getting five kilowatts out of the uh, alternator. That's just amazing. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing on the market that comes close to it. So I can sit at anchor, I can run my engine at 1200 RPM, which is you know not much above idle speed. Yeah. And, uh, and it's also quite quiet. And, uh, and that thing's putting out um, seven kilowatts. And uh, yeah, not only that, that seven kilowatts is enough of a load on the engine at that low speed to where I'm almost at the peak fuel efficiency for the engine. So I'm actually getting, even at anchor, generating like that, I'm more efficient than a standalone generator. Yeah, and that's what you want. It's that sweet spot. I saw the, I did, I saw your video that, uh, I think it was about last year or maybe 18 months ago that you released. Yes, yeah. Yeah, you were wearing a lab coat. I saw I, it over you. You looked like that, such a scientist. Right, we're, we're about to start the video and they, they gave that to me and made me wear it. I felt kind of stupid in it. But... I, I, you were such a scientist. I'm like, Nigel doesn't <laughs> yeah. need, you could, you could have come in there and sweats. Right. I was like, no, no, it's yeah. Nigel, man. He doesn't right. need to. Pretend to be a scientist. <laughs> That's the one and only time I've ever worn a lab coat. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I saw you on. I'm like, no, no, this guy doesn't need to wear one. He, yeah. he doesn't, he doesn't, I mean, you can put one. You can wear one, but he doesn't need one. <laughs> yeah. You know, we uh, we spent. Oh, my nose is itching again. Um, we spent uh, three million dollars of of uh, some big corporation in the U.S. funded that project. Three million dollars developing that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That was their yeah. money, and then, then we had other money that we put in. So it, it, it was a pretty intense uh, development program. The stuff is paper; it's really easy. We know exactly what we want to do, but uh, but actually making it all work, and then building a controller that can handle that kind of power. And then uh, we, one of the tests I, I did was to uh, run the thing up to eight kilowatts and open circuit the batteries. To see what oh, would happen, yeah. you know, with an yeah, alternator, did. you immediately smoke the alternator. You blow all the diodes. Yeah, that's what well, I heard. Our yeah. controller uh, reacted so fast, and it had such a, a decent dump capability that it shut the system down without any damage. Oh wow, that yep. quick? Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's what you want because otherwise you're going to lose right. that all. I mean, that alternator's right. got to be. Right. You, you, can't, you don't want to lose uh, that alternator. You know, I, I drew up a list of design characteristics that I wanted to see in the thing. I have no technical capability whatsoever to, to make it happen, but I know what we want because I've been doing this for long enough and dealing with the bits of kit that we have and the failings that they have. So I know what I want. Uh, it's a matter of finding the people that can then take that and translate it into a piece of kit that will do that. Yeah.
And, and that's what we were able to do with that project. Let's talk a fallacy of lithium iron. Uh, we all know they have a really high cycle life. Yeah, iron phosphate, which is most of the batteries we see, has um, at least 2,000 cycles if it's yeah. treated properly. So if you do the math, um, you, you say I can get 70% out every cycle and I got 2,000 cycles, and then you assume that you can do all of that. Uh, and then you look at the cost of the battery as compared to lead acid and you do the same analysis with lead acid. It turns out that in the long run, lithium ion is cheaper than lead acid. Mm -hmm. However, the fallacy here is to assume that you're gonna get those 2000 cycles. I have never met a boater yet that, that cycled the battery 2000 times. So if you only cycle that battery, say 300 times, because you only use the boat half a dozen weekends of the year, um, then uh, it's way more expensive than a lead acid battery for the energy that you, you put in and out of that battery. So we have to, we have to acknowledge the, the, the single strongest talking point in terms of the cost benefit of lithium ion is probably not one that most boat owners can actually use because we don't have the capability to, to exploit that high cycle life. Yeah, and, I, and, and that's where I get always concerned when a product is using some sort of same thing would be Nigel to me is the 3C thing. You know, it, a lot of people are advertising like, oh, you know, lithium can charge at three times capacity. It's nonsense. Oh, you look at the lithium batteries we have in the marine marketplace, and most of them don't want to be charged at more than 0.3C. Yeah, which actually and, is substantially less than an AGM battery. And even where are you going to find that charger? I'm like, yeah. okay, 3C. Yeah. Okay, let's great. Awesome. Perfect. All right, good. No problem. Congratulations. Yeah. Good. All right. Now tell me where you're going to, okay, your battery bank is, let's call it a 400 amp hour battery bank at 12 volts. That's four golf cart batteries. That is not a big battery bank. You know, 400 amp hours is a tiny battery bank for any boat above 30 feet. To, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's vanilla. Like there's nothing to it. It's like, it's just a sedan, four doors. That's it. It's basic. I'm like, okay, 400 amp hours. Do three C of that 1200 amps. Okay. Yep. Start looking online for a 1200 amp charger, 600 amp charger, 300 amp charger. Yep. Yep. You know, where are you going to find a charger that is ever going to give you the yep. benefits of that theoretical yep. charge rate? Well, in any case, we don't have that charge rate with the batteries we're using because those are automotive batteries where they're built for acceleration and they're also built to handle massive braking, regenerative braking spikes. So right. in the boat world, we have energy batteries that are designed to uh, accept and deliver energy much more slowly. So yeah. most of the boat batteries, lithium ion batteries we have, uh, are looking at 0.3C, not 3C, one tenth of yeah. that charge rate. Many of some of them will go to 0.5C and a handful of them will go to 1C. In my yeah. own boat, because we've got that integral um, alternator that will put out eight kilowatts and we had an eight kilowatt uh, battery bank, eight kilowatt hour, then I wanted the one C rate. And in terms of the available lithium ion batteries in the boat world, that's pushing the boundaries of most of those batteries. Mm -hmm. Many of them, they don't want to do that. So uh, whereas actually you can pump one C into any AGM battery up to about 50% state of charge. So ironically, uh, there are AGM batteries which will accept a higher charge rate than a lot of the lithium ion batteries we have. Also, if you found this video interesting, please subscribe. Um, it honestly it does it does help us to know that all this time that we're investing is actually we're reaching a lot of voters. And I want to thank all of you for watching. Thanks for spending some time with me.